So hi, my name is Lara Nezonye. I'm not very good at computers. I am um, a team lead, lock picker, pickpocket, magician, challenge designer, and I'm really passionate about security. The thing is, I think we people sometimes work really hard for little results, whereas I'm more of someone who uses little tricks to great effects. So basically, the trick I, I have today is, if it's stupid and it works, then it's not stupid. So like we work really, really hard, and I'm really trying my best to find ways, stupid ways to improve your security testing. Um, today, we're going to be testing several things, such as physical security, social engineering tricks. Um, and we're also dabbling a bit in defense, because people told me my, my talks were quite uh, offense-oriented, so I'm helping the blue team as well. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk, and I'm going super fast because we have like 20 tricks in 20 minutes. Physical security, everybody's favorite. Um, I really encourage you to try those, but there are some things you need to, to take into account. Have you seen one of those? Those are like basic HID um, pin readers. Now, how could you attack this one? So the fancy way to do it is to buy a like cover 2D printed that you put over and you over engineer your solution until it works. Or you go the stupid way and you buy Tide. Do not eat the Tide. <laughs> simply, put, simply put a little dab on each, uh, pin, on each keys. And, pin, and Tide to go is UV fluorescent. So like in the movies, you can like know what pins they type. Well, the four characters of the pins they type. And it costs like one buck. It's that simple, works really well. It, you, all you need to do is to buy like one tied to go pen. It goes really well in your red team kit. It's that simple. Why do more? Uh, physical intrusion. So some of you might do physical intrusion. We're getting in, you, you piggybacked. And then you get, get into this paranoid mode. Like you're into this, oops, spoiler. You're into this very large office, and uh, in that office, like it's an open space. You feel everybody's looking at you. You know, how can I get in? And of course, like in such an office, everybody's seeing what you're doing. So what's the next step? Well, you pre-print this amazing letter saying reserved for taxes purposes, this accountant for the whole week, apologies. And you stick it there. And like every single time somebody gets in, into your, your room, you're like, yeah, sorry, that meeting is reserved. Not my, not my choice. And you're able to reserve a room for a week. And so we had to go to a client every day for a week. We put that on and we were able, like by the fourth day, they knew we were here. They said hi. <laughs> and like, <laughs> it's very, very nice. It's quite simple, but it's worth it. Um, I'm going really fast. Uh, logical attacks. So the first one here, can somebody tell me what's wrong with this picture? Once, tw twice. All right. So you might notice my name is Xerox Printer 317. Why? Well, this is the world's easiest NAC bypass. So printers aren't really friendly with uh, NACs. So if you can't attack the technology, attack the process. So admins are super used to having alerts saying, oh, then this. Uh, this printer wants to connect to the NAC, should you whitelist it? So they're super used of clicking yes. So all you gotta do is call your name Xerox printer or inkjet something something, and, <laughs> and you'll see some admins will just whitelist you, and it's as simple as this. <laughs> so don't, like, there are really advanced NAC bypass, but changing your host name is, I think, fairly simple. By the same token, social engineering, few tricks. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with social engineering, but there are ways to establish credibility or to enhance your social engineering game. It's, and it's quite difficult. It's a nerve wracking the first few times you do it. So I hope those tricks work. So the first one is, if you're doing social engineering in a like, in a business environment, you all have suits. 
But sometimes the corporate culture, people have polos or like, you, how can you, what's the next step? Like, how can you be further more convincing? So I got this weird hobby. I collect lanyards. <laughs> and lanyards are super cheap on eBay. On uh, Kijiji, you can buy like 10 for $1. Uh, you might notice some of your companies there. I apologize. Um, <laughs> There are several more, um, and basically, they don't care about your, 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 your card if you got a right lanyard. Like, for real, who cares? You're not skidded. So all I do is I put the lanyard in my pocket like this. Nobody sees my card. And I just go, hi, and I get in. And it's a simple thing. Of course, if you're like, here is my lanyard, of course it's super shady. But if you don't care about it, my favorites are ones are like auditors, because nobody wants to talk to an auditor. So <laughs> it works super well. So lanyards, they're like, I wish I had purchased one for several for everybody, but legal stuff. Um, but that works really well. And that, like people think about the suit, but stupid things like a lanyard will really go a great way. One more thing, disarming doubt. So it's an actually quite funny story. We were in this engagement and we had to find the, um, the, the username format. So I call, I spoof my number, such a, like every social injury thing, and the person is super suspicious. I, I present myself as that guy I found on LinkedIn. And he's like, are you really? And I'm like, yeah, I'm logging in, I have like that domain name slash uh, sorry, I have that domain name. Then the little line that's titled, that's tiled to the left. He's like, the little line that's tiled to the left? What do you mean? Well, you know, the line that's not straight. And you, under and you see him like, oh. <laughs> that's a backslash, sir. Your account is this. So I went from being the super, like, suspicious person to, oh, that's just another user who forgot his account. So as you're doing social engineering, you don't always have to use authority. Playing it dumb works really well. And the word, that little line that goes to the left is a great convincer. Same like when you say, uh, uh, the way you say dots, like, um, or dash, you don't say dash, you say très d'union, or like the way, the way you say it, like, think about your parents, think about your grandparents, the way they say things. That's exactly what you want to reproduce. And you'll see the, uh, the awareness of the people will go way, way down. Like, it's not difficult. You just need to think about in what context can I disarm the people. So, those were the very few offensive tricks this, this time, because now we're going to catch some pen testers and threats sometimes. Because this talk was called Stupid Purple Tricks. And the, the reason why is because there are some offensive tricks, what is called red team, and some stupid tricks for blue teams. Because we as pen testers sometimes make stupid mistakes too. Um, let me just come, let's start with a word of warning though. Um, if you catch pen testers, make sure you catch threats as well. Like, you can't just say, oh, we had a pen test, we had this rule to catch a pen test from that company because we hard coded their MAC address, we won, and then expect you to be actually secure. So, there are tricks to catch pen testers, and it's fine, just keep in mind that as long as you keep catching threats, it's totally fine. But you can't just say, we catch pen testers, we're secure. I had to give this warning. So, let's attack tools. This one is called Better Cap. Um, Better Cap is a terrible, terrible tool. For people who used it, it's like there's one switch that's minus minus apocalypse, and it does men in the middle, HTTP sniffing, it does everything. So I was on this pen test once, super secure zone where nobody should know about. Like this top secure, there's no users usually. I'm doing men in the middle, and I see this link. So it's an HTTP link, it's a YouTube link. I visit the YouTube link and I have a Rick Astley, like a Rick roll. And I'm like, who in that zone keeps sending me Rick roll links? So I go visit the SOC and I'm like, 
good job, guys, you caught me, right? That's amazing, good job. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> we didn't send you those. And then we start stressing a bit, because that zone, there should not be any users. It's like a super secure zone, and somebody keeps sending Rickroll links. <laughs> so several investigations later, we find out that this link here in HTTP, it's hard-coded in better cap. So you will keep sending a probe every 10 minutes to that YouTube link for status reasons. Now you might ask yourself, wait, isn't there a better, better cap called better cap ng? Yes. Is that feature still there? Yes. <laughs> so as a SOC, having a trigger on that HTTP link is a very good IOC to let you know well, perhaps there's somebody playing with better cap. I mean, that's a stupid IOC, but I'm fairly sure that works. Um, Partial Empire. I don't know if you, all of you guys know Partial Empire. It's a very, very good post-exploitation, exploitation tool. It's like Metasploit, but for the last 10 years. It's very, very good. Um, but sometimes it's difficult to identify What's, the, um, what's the, the listener? So how can I know if that website in my log runs a listener? And this isn't my idea, it's an idea from Louis who might be in the audience, but I felt it was super smart. Um, if you look right here, you might see there's a hard-coded key like in the, in the code, it's not an option, you can't dis disable it, but there's a page called welcome.png. So with a very, very, very simple script, like it's six lines, seven lines, you can identify uh, Empire listeners. All you're gonna do is, is there a welcome to PNG? Is there an image? And does that image match this hash? And you'll find partial Empire's listeners like this. So it's a, it's a default, people could change it, but in the wild so far, I, have ne I haven't found anybody who Change that, change that setting. So as, as a blue team, all you gotta do is run that, those six lines of Python to, to, all, if, to all your websites if you'd like, and you'll see what are the listeners. Um, same thing for Kali, Burp. Um, in a SOC, you might log your DNS requests. And I'm sure you know that Kali, every time you boot it up, makes a request to Kali.org to update itself. So the moment you see a DNS request for a Kali .org, to archive the Kali.org, you know there's a pen testers inside. Because I'm not sure I've seen any non pen testers run Kali. Like there, there's very little business requirements to run Kali as far as I know. Um, same for Burp. Burp is the de facto pen testing tool for web app. I think it's a great tool. But the moment you open, you open it, it checks for an update. So if you see a request to perfdata.portswigger.net, you know you have a burp, somebody using burp on the inside. So those are like stupid IOCs, but they're really, really simple to make, and you'll be able to catch pen testers and sometimes threats. Now, how about attacking tools? So, for example, burp. As I said, burp is a really, really nice tool, but I want to know if somebody is using it, testing my website. Now, as you know, Burp does not, you can set up Burp the way that all the requests are exactly the same. Like, you, it, it, it could be an exact copy of a request from Internet Explorer, so how can you tell? Well, the thing is, Burp listens on slash slash Burp on every single port by default. So all you have to do, it's very simple. You visit the, you have a, a script that all it does is it try to load burp on three random ports, say one, two, three, four, eight, zero, eight, nine, and 5,501. And if all those three pages load, then you know burp is open. It's that simple. So 
on the, this little GIF, GIF here, sorry, on this GIF, all you see is I visit the website first without burp, and I have this burp testing page. And all I do, do is I change it to have burp listen, I click on the same link, and I have, if it works, of course, burp detected. So it's a super, super simple script. And as I kept, it's like, well, it, I have the sources, it doesn't show in this, because resolution, it's on the page. It's a super simple script. It's like six, ling, six lines of, uh, of HTML. Um, well, I told you the, how to do it. You check if those iframes load, if they do success. And that's it. Um, but the same idea, and this isn't, well, I, I felt I was the first to discover it until I read this great blog by Gilles Voisin. Um, I think he's French, I, so if he's here, congrats. Um, basically, you can lie to burp. You can have a web page as a polyglot that as you, if you look at it in burp, it has a different behavior than if you look at it in a, in a browser. And that's because the way meta tags are prioritized. So in a web page, you have a header saying this is encoded using this, whereas in the, it, it, there's a meta tag that could tell the same thing. Now, usually browsers will prioritize the header over the meta HTML tag. But Burp does it the other way around, so that's something what it looks like when you're opening your file in Burp. So it's super simple, but most people, when they get this, they don't understand why, and it could be some form of security through obscurity. Is it foolproof? No. Will it block script kiddies that take most of your website? Yeah, perhaps. Um, by the same token, uh, I thought about vaccinating hosts. So most commodity malware, they check for the presence of a debugger. They check if there's something like using fine window, is there a debugger that's debugging me? And if there is, it exits saying I'm being debugged, this is bad. How can I lie to my system and make it look like there's a debugger present? Now I am sure there are super fancy ways my favorite is using calc. So you might know calc.exe being the most favorite uh, hacking tool of everybody if you're going to recon or conferences, like when you see calc, you're happy. Um, it's basically the same thing. So you take calc.exe, you copy it, and you call it debug.exe. That's the first difficult step. The second step using PowerShell, you can start it, you can start it at startup and having I have, it, I have it hidden. The reason why is just because you don't want to have a user who keeps deleting or closing it, and voila. Like most community malware will just exit because you have a debug.exe process running, and that's it. Thanks, Calc, <laughs> and you're set. So, of course, do please run an antivirus and like, it, I'm not saying it's foolproof, I'm saying it's helpful. So please don't quote me saying this was the, like, it's not the revolutionary idea, it just sometimes works and it's super stupid. Um, and that's it. Like, stupid tricks, do you have any questions for stupid purple teamer tricks? No? All right, well, that's already 22 minutes, so thank you very much and have a nice day.